they don't live in the real world. They live in a world of their own. They see themselves as exceptional, extraordinary, entitled. The narcissist needs to be the center of attention. Anybody else that's getting any attention is a threat. Welcome to Fill in the Blanks. This is going to be a bit different because I'm kind of starting a series here and I want this to be more of a conversation than a broadcast or what you might typically think of as a podcast. Because I want to talk about some mental disorders, some mental illnesses. I'm talking particularly about a category called personality disorders. And I'm doing this because I get asked about this a lot. I'm going to start by talking about one of those that I get asked about probably more than any others, and I'm talking about narcissism, the narcissistic personality disorder. Yes, it is a disorder, and I suppose that everybody has an ego, so certainly these things all occur on the continuum. But those that I get asked about the most are the narcissistic personality disorder and the borderline personality disorder. So I want to talk to you about what it really means, what we're really talking about when we say narcissism and narcissistic personality disorder. And then I want to talk to you about how to live with, deal with, cope with, recognize, manage, and handle the narcissistic personality disorder. There's more than one type of narcissistic personality disorder, but we're talking about, generally speaking, a pattern of grandiosity in fantasy or behavior, a need for admiration, and a lack of empathy. So let's talk about what I just said. A pattern of grandiosity. What's that mean? Grandiosity, fancy word, but that means that people see themselves in a real exaggerated fashion. I mean, they just think they're hot stuff, right? They're a big deal. Everybody else is second class. Nobody is interesting except them, which is why you see them and hear them talking about themselves all the time. And you're just there to be an audience. You're just there to be manipulated. You're just there to be exploited. You're just there to be used. Now, when we talk about grandiosity, we're talking about in fantasy or behavior. By fantasy, we mean they don't live in the real world. They live in a world of their own. They see themselves as exceptional, extraordinary, entitled, and their behavior will reflect that. They behave as though the rules don't apply to them. They behave as though you don't have rights. They do. They behave as though everything must revolve around them. A lot of people that road rage are narcissists. They get in traffic and they expect that it's just going to open up like the Red Sea. They get on the freeway. They expect all the cars to just pull over to the shoulder and let them go through. These people don't know who they are. They don't know that they have important things to do, and so they get very upset if people don't let them run their own agenda. A need for admiration. These people need to be the center of attention. Look, everybody has a way of being in the world, right? I mean, some people come in to the room like a house of fire. Some people come in like a cool breeze. Some people are happy to just kind of drift in and kind of read the room, see what's going on. Not the narcissist. The narcissist needs to be the center of attention. And anybody else that's getting any attention is a threat. Anybody else that's getting laughs, anybody else that's getting focused on, anybody else that's of interest, we need to get rid of them because all the attention needs to be on the narcissist. They have a really pathological need for admiration. They need people to tell them how smart they are, how interesting they are, how special they are, show them how entitled they are. And if that doesn't happen, they get very upset. They get very frustrated. 
and they can go on the attack. And when we say a lack of empathy, these folks just don't have the ability to stand in somebody else's shoes. Somebody might show up late to work and you say, oh, you're never late. What, what happened? I might say, oh, just as I was leaving this morning, my dog got out and was hit by a car and killed my dog. What would be a normal reaction? People would go, oh, my gosh, you must feel terrible. I'm so sorry. Not a narcissist. A narcissist doesn't have the ability to identify with that person's feelings. So they might say, huh, well, you're here now. Or, uh, what kind of dog? Huh, well, you'll have to get another one. So anyway, what I was wanting to talk to you about, what, they have no ability to reflect feelings. They have no ability to identify with what that person might be experiencing at the time and be empathetic. Now, this is different from sympathetic. I'm talking about empathetic, where they can identify with that person's feelings, put themselves in their position for a minute, and understand how they might be feeling. They don't have that ability, which is why it's very difficult for them to ever have a close relationship with anybody. So we're talking about a sense of self-importance and entitlement, preoccupation with fantasies. They create this world of how special and how important they are. They believe that they're special. They believe that they're unique. They're very exploitive. They're very arrogant. So you'll see them doing something that you would think, oh my gosh, they must be embarrassed about this. They don't read the room. You might see them saying or doing something that anybody would be embarrassed to say or do, and everybody in the room's rolling their eyes. The narcissist doesn't see that because they don't read the room. They're not interested in anybody's opinion. They just want to know that they're the focus of attention, and they assume everybody thinks they're as special and unique as they think they are. Again, they're very envious of anybody else that thinks they're special or has a unique perspective or point of view. Now, understand that when we're talking about these kind of people, they're very, very difficult to get along with unless you're willing to subordinate your interest, your needs to these people at all times. And if you're not, they're going to put you in your place. To give you a better sense of what I mean, I'm going to play a clip from Dr. Phil where I describe some real-life people throughout history as well as some fictional characters that have been profiled in ways consistent with narcissism. Check it out. You've all seen Scarface, right? You remember Tony Montana, the fictional character from the movie Scarface? It was one of the best depictions of an antisocial drug lord who used violence to gain wealth. Now, he was obsessed with himself. His cocaine-fueled paranoia jump-started his downfall. He was a subset of a malignant narcissist, and that's a subset of narcissism. Some narcissists just want all the attention. Some weaponize it. And that's what we call malignant. Adolf Hitler showed traits of paranoia, a huge need for excessive admiration. He exploited others and believed so much in his own superiority that along with a lack of empathy, he managed to kill millions of people. According to FBI profiler and criminal expert Candace DeLong, Chris Watts, you know, we did a lot about Chris Watts, the family annihilator who was sentenced to prison for the murders of his wife, Shannon, and two young daughters, again, a malignant narcissist. People said, well, why would he not just get a divorce instead of killing his pregnant wife and two innocent young daughters? Because he was so narcissistic, he didn't want that baggage. He wanted a fresh start. Narcissists don't read the room. They don't think, how's this going to play out a week from now or a month from now? They only look at it from their point of view. Remember the movie, The Devil Wears Prada? Miranda Priestly? A perfect example of a narcissist, obsessed with physical appearance, cold, demanding, expected perfection, intensely critical of her employees if they fell short. Now, 
Stop and ask yourself, if you deal with people like this in your life, how often are you going to encounter somebody that is truly a narcissist? There are people that think they're special and they may kind of be show-offs or whatever. A lot of people are that way sometimes. When I'm talking about a narcissistic personality disorder, I'm talking about a consistent pattern of behavior that you'll see over and over again. Not occasionally, not they just have a day where they just kind of think they're all hot stuff. I'm talking about a pattern of behavior across time. Now, these people tend to gaslight you if you try to call them on their behavior. In fact, I always tell people that ask me about it, they say, look, I've put up with all this that I'm going to put up with. So, Doc, I'm just going to call them out. I'm just going to confront them and get in their face and let them know you're not special. You're not unique. You're taking advantage of me, and I'm not putting up with it anymore. So what do you think, Doc? Don't you think I should do that? You know what I always tell people? Don't bother. First off, they already know what they're doing. You're not going to tell them anything. So if you're doing that, you're doing it for you, not for them, because they're not going to change based on what you say to them. What they're going to do is gaslight you. You're going to hear a lot of statements like, you're the narcissist. I never said that. I'm not angry. I'm not taking advantage of you. I'm not that way. You're that way. Look at you. You're judging me. They're going to play the victim role and attack you, and before it's over, they're going to be in a victim role and telling you that you're the one with the problem, and trust me, they have more staying power than you do. They will never give it up. These folks don't respond to therapy very well at all. About a third of them that get into therapy, they'll get up and walk out in a rage as soon as you start to take their inventory. About a third of them will find something about the therapist they don't like, and they'll start criticizing and trying to get into a battle of wills, try to win a debate rather than learn anything. And the remainder, they might try to listen for a period of time. Some might get some better, but I can tell you, generally speaking, I think some of these people actually get worse in therapy than better because the therapist tries to point out to them what their deficiencies are, such as a lack of empathy. And they say, what do you mean? And they might use the example that I used of what happens when somebody comes in and says their dog got run over. So what they're doing is basically teaching the narcissist how to mimic empathy. So all they've done is make the narcissist more dangerous because now the narcissist at least knows how to mimic the first layer of empathetic conversation or behavior. And that's why I say they've actually made them worse. They now have given them the tools to at least hide their narcissism a little bit better. So I think it's very, very difficult. When you go to talk to them and say, look, I see you for what you are. I know what you're doing, it's not going to get you anywhere. I'm going to tell you how to deal with it. I'm going to tell you what you can do in a minute, but mm, not really going to help to confront them. Now, I talked about narcissism in kind of a general sense, the grandiosity, the sense of entitlement, how arrogant they are, ignoring the rules, thinking they're special, dominating attention. And people ask just how frequent is this? You know, I think statistics say that maybe it's as much as 10 or 15% of certain populations, but it kind of depends on what group you're talking about. I've heard some people say if you get into certain populations like Hollywood, <laughs> television, movie stars, whatever, that, you know, maybe it's 50%, not 15%, that if somebody's got a big enough ego that they have their own TV show or a movie star, 
that it's about half. Watch it. I know what you're thinking. But I think if you're in certain populations, it's probably more frequent than it is in others. Management, CEOs, doctors, leadership positions. I think the truth is that sometimes our society does reward some of this behavior. And I've said we shouldn't reward bad behavior, but sometimes we do pay off those that have these aggressive tendencies. But the truth is that there are really four kinds of narcissism, not just one general kind of narcissism. You know, one is the classic narcissist that I described. That's the classic kind of egotistical, attention-seeking, entitled narcissist. The second category that I like to break out are what I call the malignant narcissist. These have all the characteristic and traits of the classic narcissist that I described, but this particular subset are mean. They weaponize all of those things that we just talked about. They seek to hurt people. They use that arrogance. They use that entitlement. They use that to wreck people's lives, ruin their careers, break up their families, destroy their self-esteem and self-worth purposely. They weaponize it, they target people, and they go after them. Malignant narcissists are, in common parlance, kind of psychopaths. They hurt people. They mean to hurt people because they're mean. The third category is a very interesting group. It's called the covert narcissist. Now, these folks sometimes are a little harder to spot, but trust me, they're just as narcissistic as the strutter. They're just as narcissistic as the blowhard that wants to be the center of attention at all times. But the covert narcissist is one that likes to play the victim role. They're blamers. They're still going to have the entitlement. They're still going to expect to be the center of attention, but they're going to do it more passively. They're going to blame others for anything that goes wrong, but believe you me, they're still going to be the center of attention. They're going to take the victim role and tell you how they've been hurt, how they've been taken advantage of by management or the government or their wife or their husband. And when you listen to them, the things they're claiming are going to be, if you listen carefully, not at all encroachments on their rights, but just someone else asserting their rights. But you're going to hear them saying that they're so special. How could someone do this to them? It's just a matter of whether they're screaming it from the mountaintops or they're sitting over in a corner telling you how special they are, asking you, don't you think that I'm right about this? Don't you think? Isn't it true that they're going to be trying to think for you? and put words in their mouth and control you from the bottom side up instead of the top side down. They're passive aggressive, but they still control you a lot. But if you listen and watch, all the entitlement, all of the expectations are still there. They're just much less passive about expressing it. Now, the fourth type, this is one of the ones that I guess is kind of a pet peeve of mine. And this is the communal narcissist. These are the people that, particularly in our exhibitionistic society now, where people think if they brush their teeth, they have to have a camera on them. With the internet, the communal narcissist, you always hear them and see them talking about all of the great and wonderful things that they do. They're always telling you about how they saved these children, 
how much money they give to this cause, how they travel to the depths of the jungle to save these dirty-faced, hungry children, how many awards they got. You'll see them at all of these charity functions. You'll see them at all of these galas, and you're always seeing them. They never find a lens, a camera, lights that they don't like. They're always up front telling you what a wonderful giver they are, how much they contribute. Look at me. What a philanthropist I am. What a giver I am. And you can't give them enough attention. I mean, some of these organizations, they'll give them a little money, and it's like, oh, my God. They're forever in their debt. There's no way you can ever please them, no way you can ever thank them enough, no way you can ever do enough. And let me tell you, it won't be long before they become offended. You can't name enough buildings after them. You can't put enough publicity out there. You can't put them at enough head tables. It's just a matter of time till you're going to offend them and they move on to the next organization. But you know these people. You see them. They're always standing there with a trophy or an award and saying, look at me. You know, at least they do some good. I guess they do give some money or whatever. Those are the four types. So how do you deal with these people? How do you live with these people? How do you get along with these people? And how do you recognize if you actually have one of these people In your life, I recommend that you don't try and fix a narcissist. I've made stabs at that. I've made efforts at that. When I was a young lion and was going to heal the world, I'd take on whatever. It's above your pay grade. You're not going to do it. I'm not going to do it. Now, there are those that believe that you're not going to change a narcissist no matter what you do. And people ask me, why not? Can't anybody learn to change? And sure, in theory, anybody can learn to change. People ask me where these folks come from. Why does somebody turn out to be a narcissist and somebody else doesn't? And isn't it true if you kind of know that, then maybe you know where to start working on them to change them? Nobody really knows where this comes from. I'll tell you what some of the primary theories are. Maybe it'll give you some insight to excuse yourself from feeling responsible for fixing it. You know, people ask, is this something genetic? Is it environmental? I think the research is very ambiguous, but I think most people would agree that it's a learned behavior. Most people would agree that they come from the extremes of parenting. They either had a parent that was way overprotective, carried the kid around on a satin pillow, and made the child believe that they were entitled by turning him into spoiled brats. And I always say, we're not raising children, we're raising adults. And so, whatever you do with your child, that's what you're creating as an adult. So I said the extremes of parenting. One is you've treated your child in such a way that they become a spoiled brat child, so they become a spoiled brat adult. And the other extreme of parenting, of course, is if they've been neglected or abused. And so this is a reaction of, I'm going to be so arrogant, it's kind of a get them before they get me strategy in life, where they just become so self-protective by being arrogant and haughty and entitled, that nobody's ever going to do that to me again because I'm going to put myself above everybody so I can't be hurt. I'm going to fly above the crowd where I can't be hurt. These are theories. I'm not presenting this to you as fact. I'm telling you what psychodynamicists say when they say, you know, look at the parents if you want to understand why somebody turns out the way they do as an adult. Now, does that make it easier for you to suffer these people or not? You know, maybe it does. If you are not that way and you have empathy, maybe understanding it gives you a little bit of staying power. As I said before, 
I'm one of those people that thinks anybody can change. I'm the incurable optimist, but these are people that just don't have a good prognosis. There's some mental illness problems that have good prognosis, like phobias. Somebody has a phobia, anxiety, you can deal with that, and it's got a very good prognosis. Personality disorders don't have the best prognosis because in the individual's eyes, what they're doing is working for them. And so their belief is, why fix what ain't broke? A narcissist doesn't respond well in part because they don't see a problem. They think they're special. They think they're unique. They think they got it going on. They live in a fantasy world in which they are the top dog. They are the unique, entitled, special individual. So what is there to fix? It's the rest of you that have the problem. Catch up. Get your game together. I don't have the problem. You have the problem. You can't change what you don't acknowledge. You all have heard me say that. A narcissist is not going to acknowledge that they have a problem. Why would they have a to-do list? And the answer is they wouldn't. They don't. They don't have a to-do list. Most personality disorders don't have a to-do list because they think what they're doing is protecting them, working for them, getting them what they want. So if you're not going to change them, what are you going to do? Well, you're going to have to learn to deal with them. You're going to have to learn to not allow yourself to be sucked down by these people, to not get into their ego suck hole where you just get pulled down into this dark, bottomless pit where you cannot ever do enough to make these people happy. And the first thing I want you to do is establish some boundaries and recognize it's not your job to fix them. You couldn't fix them if it was your job. And you cannot let them have the power to determine how you feel about who you are. If you give them the power to determine your self-worth in a relationship, whether it's romantic or as a family member or at work, whatever the situation, if you give them the power to determine your validation, your self-worth, I promise you, you're going to lose because they have to put you down in order for them to feel better. It's what I call leveling. They either have to build themselves up so they feel equal to or superior, or they have to shoot you down so they don't think you've got anything over on them. That's leveling. They can't be in a one-down position ever, so they always have to, in some way, keep you from having any advantage. And if you feel good about yourself, if you are at peace with yourself, if you think you're in touch with your authentic self, if you have a good sense of self-worth, a good definition of self, they can't suffer that because it gives you a sense of power and peace that they just can't endure. So they have to take that away from you. They have to tear that down. You cannot let that happen. So that's why I say you've got to set up a boundary, and you cannot take the bait, and you cannot be the bait. And let me tell you what I mean by that. These people are going to say things that anybody would find offensive. They're going to violate your rights. And it's not just being assertive. Assertiveness is when someone acts in a way to protect their own rights, but they do it without stepping on anyone else's rights. Aggressiveness is when people assert their rights and they trample all over someone else's rights. That's what a narcissist does. They do it by gaslighting, and I'm going to tell you what I mean by that. If you're dealing with a narcissist, get out your fire extinguisher because you're going to get gaslit. 
They are going to talk to you in such a way that anything that goes wrong is your fault. And anything that they do is your fault. You're going to hear phrases. I mentioned a few of them before. I didn't say that. I'm not mad. It's not that big a deal. Why are you being so sensitive? Why are you blowing this all out of proportion? What is wrong with you? What is wrong with you? I just want to be happy. I just want to get along. I'm just trying to have a life here. You're making a big deal out of everything. I'm not upset. I wasn't yelling. I'm just passionate. You're the one with the problem. You're the one that's upset. You're the one that's making a big deal here. What's wrong with you? And it all keeps coming back to what's wrong with you. And they're happy to answer that question. You're too sensitive. You're just too sensitive. You don't like it when I'm happy. You don't like it when I'm doing what I need to do. You have to be in control. You're the one that's judging. You're the one that thinks you're better. It's not me. You think you're better than me. Look at you. You're judging me. That's the gaslighting phrases you're going to hear. And if you don't have a boundary, you're going to take that bait and start questioning yourself whether or not, well, maybe it's me. Maybe it's me. But what do I want you to do? I want you to remember this conversation that we're having right now. I told you this was going to be a little different, that I just wanted it to be a conversation. And I want you to remember when this happens, you know what? When I was on my walk and I was listening to Dr. Phil in my earbuds, this is exactly what he was talking about. This person is using the exact ideology that he was talking about. Now, the word choice might be a little bit different, but the sentiment will be the same, and that is, you're the problem, not me. You're too sensitive. You're too touchy. You're too hair-triggered. Whatever their words are going to be, it's going to all come down to, this is your fault. You're creating the problem, not me. If you would just settle down, we would be fine. If you're hearing that, I want you to remember this conversation and say, this is exactly what I was hearing from Dr. Phil. These are exactly the things that we were talking about. Now, to do this, when I say boundaries, you've got to put up some fence lines. You've got to say, look, I know who I am. I know what's right. I know what's wrong. You hear sometimes how interrogators will get somebody in a interrogation room and hotbox them. That's what a narcissist will do when they start gaslighting you. An interrogator will get a suspect in a room and they'll just pound on him and pound on him and pound on him until they coerce a confession out of him. And that's what a narcissist will do. They will hotbox you and pound on you and pound on you and pound on you until finally you say, okay, fine, I'm sorry. And that's all they need is to get you to take one step back. And then they just trample you. And the next time it comes up, they'll say, you know, you apologized for this once. And here you are doing it again. That's why I say you've got to have fence lines, and you have to be willing to walk away. You've got to be willing to turn on your heel and say, enough is enough, and too much is too much, and I'm not going to take this brow beating. I'm going to turn around and walk away. Now, what's going to happen when you turn around and walk away? I've said, I don't want you confronting a narcissist because, A, they're not going to change when you do, and B, you think you're going to vent and feel better? No, you're not. <laughs> you're just going to go through this most frustrating, circular exercise you've ever been through in your life, and you're not going to feel better. So I'm just trying to save you that frustrating experience. So what have I said? I've said, own your own feelings. Don't give them your power. I've said, don't take the bait. 
and I've said you have to have boundaries. Now, I want to talk about a different kind of boundary, and that's setting up a fence line. There's a boundary where you say, you don't get to tell me how I feel about myself. And you don't ever want to use those words. You don't ever want to tell a narcissist, you make me feel bad about myself, because that's not true. They may do things that you react to. They may make it easier for you to respond, but you got to own your own feelings. That's one kind of boundary where you keep your power. Another kind of boundary is recognizing that they only respond to action, not words. Let's talk about an example. Let's say you're in the workplace, you're dealing with a narcissist, and they are abusing or harassing you. Maybe it's sexual. Maybe they're taking credit for work that you did. Maybe they're just bullying you and making fun of you in front of other people or whatever, making you the butt of jokes, whatever. You don't ever want to bluff with a narcissist. If you tell them, I need you to stop doing this, and if you don't stop doing it, I'm going to HR, I'm filing a formal report, and I'm going to have an investigation initiated, and we'll see what happens. Don't say that if you're not ready to do it. Because if someone is making provocative comments to you, if they're making rude insinuations with sexual connotations that make you uncomfortable, and you say, I don't want you to do that anymore. You need to stop talking to me that way, and if you don't, I'm going to report it. The next time they open their mouth and say something like that, you need to stand up and walk into the HR office or your supervisor's office, and you need to file the report. Don't tell them you're going to do something that you're not going to do, because the only thing they understand is action. Then understand the gaslighting starts, they're going to go in and say, well, it's not me, it's her. She, blah, 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 blah. I understand that. But when you say you're going to do it, you absolutely have to take action. If you're married to a narcissist, if you're engaged to a narcissist, if you're dating a narcissist and they're being exploitive and you say enough is enough, If you do that to me again, if you show up an hour late again, if you embarrass me in a restaurant again, if you do this again, then you have to understand not everybody you lose is a loss and you need to be willing to get up and walk away. But don't say you are if you're not going to. Do not bluff with a narcissist because all it does is throw gas on the fire. You don't want to do that. So you need to set up boundaries in terms of keeping your own power and owning your own emotions. And then you need to set up barriers where you say, there are certain behaviors that I will not tolerate. And if you do them, I'm either going to report you or I'm going to end this relationship or whatever it is you feel that you need to do, but do it. Don't say it until you're ready to do it, because that's what they understand. If you say it, do it. Now, let me tell you what to expect when you do. Anytime an abuser loses control, and narcissists are abusers, anytime they feel control slipping away, you're going to get what you call a frustration effect. And that means it's going to ramp up. That's why the vast majority of serious injuries and murders happen after an individual leaves an abusive relationship. Not while they're in the relationship, but in the short period of time after they leave their abuser. Now, why is that? Well, because the number one tool of the abuser is isolation. And they love 
control. And when they lose that control, they panic and they ratchet up all of their control efforts to try to regain that. That's the frustration effect. They get desperate and desperate people do desperate things. So when you do this with a narcissist, expect they're going to ramp it up. And if you know that in advance, you know what's going to happen, just expect it. It's usually followed by what we call the extinction effect. They ramp it up. That's the frustration effect. But then when it doesn't work, it extinguishes. Because these people do not have confidence. They do not have staying power. And when they see that their best efforts to regain control don't work, then you will see that it extinguishes and the behavior goes away. You just have to say what you're going to do, do it, expect them to react, but stand your ground. Now, leading up to this, a narcissist is going to make you promises. Oh, you're right. I'll never do it again. I'll never do it again. I'll do better. I'll change what I'm doing. If their lips are moving, they're lying. Seeing is believing. It doesn't matter what they say. It only matters what they do. So you got to be like you were born in the center of Missouri. Show me. Is that like you're from the show me state? you dealing with them. Makes no difference what they say. It matters what they do you got to turn a deaf ear and just say, show me. If they say, I'm not going to embarrass you in a crowd again, I'm not going to show up late again because I think time is suspended for me because I'm so special and I can travel 15 miles in 1.2 minutes when it takes everybody else 30 minutes and whatever. They're not going to be rude to your mother when they get over there. They're not going to just dominate the conversation and not let anybody else speak. All the things that you have said, I'm not going to put up with anymore. It doesn't matter what they say. It's what they do. That's what you have to focus on, what they do. It's also very important that you have someone that you can talk to. Surround yourself with people that know you, people that love you, people that can validate you. Because the onslaught you get when you're living with, dealing with, working with, married to, trapped by a narcissist can be overwhelming. These people are relentless. They just don't give it up. And you, withstanding that onslaught alone, can be very difficult. Give your feelings a voice. You have to go check in with somebody that you know has your best interest at heart. And if you don't have a therapist, if you don't have a pastor or a priest, talk to your best friend. Talk to your mother. Go to a support group. Have somebody so you're not alone. Have somebody to help you reset the dial So when you get beaten down by these narcissists, whether it's a classical narcissist or a malignant narcissist that's just mean or a covert narcissist that's just so whiny and passive-aggressive but they dominate everything or a communal narcissist that's just constantly just telling you how wonderful they are and they just take all of the air out of the room and you're just suffocating to have a normal conversation with an adult, have somebody that cares about you, somebody you can talk to. And the best way to get what you need is to give away what you need. Be there for somebody else. It will fill you up, and I promise you, it comes back in multiples. So, what am I saying here? I'm saying that there's a personality type out there called narcissistic personality disorder. 
these aren't people that are just kind of nuanced. These aren't people that just, you know, they're just kind of different. These people are sick. They have a mental illness. And it's a mental illness that causes them to prey upon other people. They prey on their self-esteem. They prey on their self-worth. They prey on their relationships. They prey on their careers. They prey on their very life energy. And I don't know if it's just me or it's just that because of the Internet, we just see into more people's lives. But it does seem to me that it's just more prevalent than it used to be, and maybe it's just because we just see it more. You know, when I was growing up, coming through high school and college in the 60s and 70s, we didn't have the internet, so I didn't know what somebody was doing in the town down the road. I didn't know what was happening in New York or Denver or Kansas City or hell in the next town over. But now somebody sneezes in Denver and everybody knows about it in Beijing. Maybe we're just seeing it more. But I want you to know what's out there. I don't want you to be naive. And if you're one of these people, if you have a narcissistic personality disorder, then I'm certain that you know I'm not talking to you. because <laughs> You wouldn't possibly recognize that I'm talking to you. It couldn't possibly be you. It would have to be somebody else, right? But I want you to know the kind of personalities that are out there, because sometimes you get to thinking, you know, it's just you. Or maybe it's just the way somebody is. Well, maybe just the way they are is sick. Maybe they have a mental illness, and You haven't recognized it, and you've let it get to you. I've said there's nothing you can do to fix them, but at least if you're aware that it's them and not you, you can heed some of my suggestions here. Keep your power. Set up your fence lines. Recognize that there comes a time when you have to recognize that not everybody you lose is a loss. And know that it's not your job to fix them. Don't think you're going to vent and tell them off and feel better, because that's not how it works with them. They got more staying power than you do because they've committed their life to this, and you haven't. I tell you, the reason these people can be so effective sometimes, and the reason they sneak up on you is because you're just too healthy. You're just too healthy. You know, I've said this before, but I'll never forget it. I was interviewing some people once, and this was way back when I was in graduate school, and I was talking to some criminals at the jail. I was talking to some muggers. And I was just asking him, how are you so bold to just walk up to somebody and just hit them in the head and take their money? Aren't you afraid you're going to get punched out or you're going to walk up on the wrong guy? And they said something really interesting to me. They said, no, I'll tell you why. Because they don't think like we do. And when we walk up to them and we say, hey, have you got the time? Their reflex is to look down at their watch on their wrist. And that gives us that split second to hit them in the head. And you know why they do that? Because their mind can't go to that dark place where we live. They don't think that this person could actually be asking me that question to get an advantage over me, to get me to look away so they can hit me. They're so naive, they don't think that way. They don't think evil like we do. And it's that two or three seconds that their healthy mind has to adjust to our dark place 
that gives us that advantage. And what they were saying is, people are too healthy. Their mind doesn't go to a dark place, and it takes them a while to get there, and it's that gap that lets us in to take advantage. And it's that way sometimes when you're dealing with these personality disorders. You don't recognize what they're doing because your mind just can't conceive it. You can't conceive that somebody would dedicate their life to exploiting other people, that they would lie to you, that they would exploit you, that they would demean you just for entertainment, just to make themselves feel better. You think, why would somebody do that? And the reason you don't get it is because you're too healthy. And while you're stuck in the healthy zone, they sneak up on you. And I'm not trying to get you to be unhealthy. I'm just trying to get you to be aware that there are people out there that are. And if I can heighten your awareness, if I can get you to see them coming or recognize when they're in the room, then you can be on guard and protect yourself and those that you love. Now, I could talk all year about narcissists, things not to do, how to spot them. We can talk more about this, and if that's what you would like, just let me know and we can speak more about it. But I'm going to progress through some of these personality disorders Borderline personality is very interesting. I get a lot of people asking about that. I'll talk about that soon. And if you have questions, just go to the website, drphillintheblanks.com, and put your questions there, and I'll answer them at the beginning of the next one of these that we talk about. So that's some information on narcissism. We'll talk more. Thanks for spending this time with me. So long.